This presentation covers transmission of viruses in droplets and aerosols. We'll be covering uh, respiratory viruses, different modes of transmission of infectious disease, the size distributions of droplets carrying the viruses and how those are transformed by evaporation. We will look at virus aerosol dynamics or how those droplets and aerosols behave where they go in the, when they're in the air. We will then cover the impact of temperature and humidity. We'll briefly look at masks and then finally kind of cover what is known so far about the SARS coronavirus 2 that's currently circulating. Viruses cause many of our most common infections, our respiratory infections. Um, one of the most best known, of course, is influenza virus, but colds are also caused by things like rhinovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, adenovirus. There's a whole list of things that cause upper respiratory tract infections and lower respiratory tract infections. The size, understanding the size of the virus, or actually more importantly, the droplets that carry it is critical for understanding how those viruses are transported in, in the environment or through the air. So to orient ourselves, let's look at, um, we have a picture on the left-hand side of fine beach sand, which is about 90 micrometers in diameter, and then a human hair, which is 50 to 70 micrometers in diameter. Um, influenza virus, the flu virus, is 0.1 micrometers in diameter. So it's gonna be um, more than 100 times smaller than a human hair. And you can see a dot of, down to about 50 microns. So we're, again, we're talking about things that are over 100 times smaller. The uh, SARS coronavirus 2 is slightly larger than influenza virus, 0.12 microns. Rhinovirus is quite a bit smaller, it's 0 0.03 microns. And then adenovirus is 0.1 microns. Size is really everything when you're thinking about when you want to know how aerosols and droplets behave in the air. The airborne virus is not naked. We do not have just plain old virus floating around the 0.1 micron size. So the left image shows a flu virus, which is 0.1 microns, and the right image shows that embedded in a respiratory fluid droplet. Uh, in this slide, it's shown to scale as 0.5 microns, so about five times bigger across. But the size of those respiratory fluid droplets can range from about 0.2 microns on up to 100 microns, or even there's even much larger ones, although those fall out of the air within seconds. And so we, we typically tend not to think about them much more being in air. So the size determines the lifetime of those droplets in the atmosphere and also where the droplet will deposit in the respiratory system whether in the kind of nose and throat area or down in the bronchioles or maybe down in the alveoli. Depending on who you talk to, there are either two or four, two to four different modes of transmission. Sometimes these are, some of these are lumped together. There is direct contact, which is you shake someone's hand, let's say that they're sick, you pick up virus on your hand, and then you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth and transmit the virus that way. There's also indirect contact involving some object, such as a ball shown in this image, or maybe a door handle or a table. And that involves where the sick person touches the object and deposits virus there. And then you pick up that, you touch the object and pick up virus onto your hands and then inoculate yourself by touching your eyes, nose or mouth. Um, those objects are called fomites. There is also the large droplet route which, is involved, which involves the sick person who maybe coughs or in talking, sprays large droplets that land directly on your eyes, nose, or mouth. And then finally, there's the aerosol route where the sick person releases virus in very small droplets that end up floating around in the air. And even at a distance, you can inhale them. Um, there, typically, large droplet transmission is defined as um, droplets that are larger than five microns, and that happens only at close range, less than two meters or so. And aerosol transmission is defined as happening with droplets that are smaller than five microns and happens mainly at long range. But we'll see later on that this definition is kind of um, somewhat arbitrary and is kind of limiting our understanding of transmission. So the reality, though, is much more complicated. If someone's infected on the left-hand side, 
they release uh, viruses in these droplets through breathing, talking, coughing, and sneezing. So if someone's um, close to them, obviously, those can spray onto their face. Um, if someone's farther and they're blocked by, let's say, a laptop computer sitting on the table, um, even if that computer screen blocks the, the droplets from flying directly into the person's face, there can be smaller droplets that can float around and the other person can then inhale them. Um, deposition is also important. So those droplets can deposit onto the table or the computer um, and then someone can actually come, come around and touch them. And then also the sick person can deposit those, the, the virus onto surfaces just by touching their nose, for example, and then touching the, the object. And so then the, the so-called susceptible person who might get infected can be exposed either through inhalation by breathing in these, these airborne viruses um, or by contact. So we've seen that droplets that are expelled into air can be inhaled. They can land on people's mucous membranes or they can deposit onto surfaces where someone can touch them or they can be resuspended into air. A critical question is what size are these droplets? So there've been several studies on trying to measure kind of the total aerosols and droplets that come out when you're breathing, talking, coughing, or sneezing. Um, some of the older ones used, used methods that were not able to detect many of the submicron particles. And so I'm showing you a, a, one of the newer studies which um, did a careful job of looking at kind of the full range of particles measuring things that are smaller than 20 microns all the way down to 0.3 microns using an aerodynamic particle sizer, and then measuring things larger than 20 microns using a method called by looking at the droplets that were deposited and measuring the size of those. So this is a size distribution. The x-axis is log scale going from 0.1 to 100 microns. The y-axis shows essentially it's a, it's a measure of concentration. And this is the concentration that's in the air that's kind of in the upper respiratory tract, or you could think of it kind of coming right out of the mouth or nose and before dilution. So the APS data, aerodynamic particle size, or, or the actual measurements are shown by the, the gray diamonds. And then you can see there's a, a black line that's fitted to that. And um, you can see that the, the peak in this size distribution is actually just below one micron. So even though, um, uh, and again, this is much smaller than we can see, and this is just from breathing. So even without coughing or sneezing or talking, people are emitting respiratory droplets into the air. And you can see now when you're speaking, you have, a, again, a similar size distribution. I think the tail on the right-hand side is a little bigger because there are these kind of slightly larger droplets coming out when you talk. But again, the peak of this distribution is right around one micron. And I want to point out also the value of the y-axis. This is the peak of this distribution is kind of around 0 0.08 to 0 0.1. In the previous slide, we were also at 0 0.1. And then if we move forward to coughing, you can see the peak of this distribution is around 0 0.15. So it's not, uh, so with coughing, you only get maybe one and a half times as many particles or droplets as you do from breathing and talking. Um, and again, you can see here that the peak is just a little, just under one micron. And now finally, after they combine the data from the aerodynamic particle sizer and the droplet deposition analysis that looks at the larger particles, the larger droplets, then they came up with this distribution showed by the uh, dashed black line, which is bimodal. So that means there's kind of two peaks to it. One is uh, just around a little bigger than kind of between one to two microns. Um, and then the other, and that's a little different from what we saw in the previous figures because now they've corrected for evaporation and, and some other factors. And then the peak on the, the second peak is a little bit bigger than 100 microns, 100 to 200 microns. Um, and then they, they compare this to kind of some other data that's been published in the literature. Those are shown in the gray lines. But I also wanna point out that the y-axis here now is shown in log scale. So we're looking over about five orders of magnitude. And so there's many thousands of times more of the one to two micron droplets than there are of the, even of the, the 10 micron droplets. So we've seen the breathing, talking, and coughing release droplets that range from submicron to millimeter in size. But we want to know where is the virus? Um, what size droplets actually carry viruses? 
Um, you might think that, oh, if we just look at the volume of those droplets, the virus should kind of scale with the volume, but that doesn't seem, to, that's not necessarily the case. So before we launch into kind of looking at that data, I need to cover two different types of measure, how we measure viruses in, in a sample. So the first method is to measure the total amount of virus that's present. Um, and this represents the number, the way that we do this is look at the number of genome copies. So the genome is all of the, the RNA, in this case, uh, for the coronavirus and flu virus. Um, and that's determined by molecular techniques, specifically quantitative polymerase chain reaction or qPCR. So this reflects the number of viruses that have intact DNA or RNA. Some viruses have DNA, others have RNA. It does not indicate whether the virus is infectious or not. Because some of these viruses can be uh, inactivated or dead. They're not able to infect a cell. So the second method actually measures the amount of infectious virus, which is the, the number of viruses that are able to infect cells. And that's determined by culture, by growing the virus on the, on the host cells. And on the right-hand side, you can see an image of a of a, those, that, those are plates of a kind of a lawn, you could think of it, of purple bacteria. And then the little clear spots are a plaque. So that is supposed to represent one virus that has infected the cells and replicated and kind of spread out a little. So each of those little clear spots represents one plaque. The reason why you see more on the right-hand side and less on the left-hand side is that they've done a dilution, a kind of serial tenfold dilution in order to get uh, a number of plaques on the on the plate that they can accurately count. So on the left side, there's none to count. On the right side, there's almost too many to count. Um, but in the middle, there's it's easy to count. Um, and then so those are so each virus, each hole or let's say clear spot in that image is represents a plaque forming unit, um, and that's the the number of viruses that are capable of forming plaques on the host cells. There's also a, a related measure called a focus forming unit that we'll see. Um, another related measure is the TCID50, which is the median tissue culture infectious dose, or the concentration at which half of the cells are infected after being exposed to the sample. So we might wonder, well, what is the relationship between the two methods for flu virus at least? And, one reason we might wonder this is because there have been studies on the SARS coronavirus too, showing that um, there's viral RNA present, so they use the, the qPCR method, um, but that doesn't necessarily, and maybe they find that there's lots of it, for example, on the cruise ship, um, but they did not measure infectivity, so we don't know if that virus is infectious. And that the cruise ship story is actually kind of a, a good Rep, uh, a good example of the uh, misunderstanding between the, these two different measures, because I think the headline read that um, virus survived on the cruise ship for 17 days, but if you actually read further into the story, you'd see that they were actually measuring viral RNA. Um, so yes, the RNA was there, but we don't know if the virus is actually kind of more alive and able to infect. So this study, um, they looked at the relationship between these two, in samples that were collected from patients with confirmed flu. And you can see the x-axis shows the number of RNA camp copies per sample. And then the y-axis shows the FFU, or kind of the number of plaques. That's the measure of infectivity. Now, the R squared isn't that great, or the R isn't that great, but um, there is a, it is significant. So there's a weak but significant correlation between the virus RNA copies and the infectious virus. So now that we understand those different metrics, we can look at the size distributions of virus in the droplets. This figure shows the amount of flu virus that's in coarse versus fine droplets in exhaled breath from flu patients who were either wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. So if you look at the two left, the, the left half of the figure, that is for coarse particles or ones that are greater than five microns. If the patient wasn't wearing a mask, you can see that there were you know, anywhere from almost none to 10,000 copies, viral RNA copies of the flu virus that were detected in the, the exhaled breath. And then when the patient was wearing a mask, um, the, the median was down at zero, basically, or undetectable probably. And there were really only four patients who, uh, 
where, where some virus was detected in the coarse particles. What this shows is that the mask, the surgical mask, which they put onto the patient, effectively blocks the uh, large particles in most cases. Now, if we look at the right half of the figure, we can see that there are, first of all, the medians here are much higher than for the coarse particles. So even though the particles or droplets themselves are much smaller, the amount of virus that is present is, is much larger. So now you can see the medians around 100 copies of the virus that are released in 30 minutes by the patients. Um, and there's not much, there's not, I don't think there's a significant difference between patients who did not wear a mask and then patients who were wearing a mask. So what we conclude from this is that the mask helps block the uh, block large particles or the coarse particles containing virus from getting into the air, but it does not block the small ones. And this is not surprising um, given the, the dynamics of, of aerosols and their size and then the fact that there are gaps inevitably on the sides of these surgical masks. And then we can look further um, at patients whether they were coughing or not, because we, we think, oh, if the person's coughing, that's especially bad. And if they're not coughing, maybe it's okay. So here, the left figure shows coarse aerosols greater than five microns. And this again shows the number of RNA copies of the virus, the number of viruses, you can say total ones, um, over a 30 minute sampling period. So even with no cough, the person was releasing over 10,000 virus RNA copies into the air. And then you can see that if, uh, if the person was, was, not cough, was not coughing much, less than one cough per minute, the numbers were, were kind of similar. And then if they are coughing, again, the numbers don't, make, don't seem to be that different in this case for the coarse aerosols, if they're coughing infrequently or coughing more frequently. Um, and again, you can see the medians are somewhere around 10,000 copies per 30 minute period. Now, if we shift over to the right-hand side and look at the, fine, the virus in fine aerosols, fine droplets that are less than five microns, um, here we can see maybe more of a difference where the, person, the patients who were not coughing had lower levels that were being released, but now you can see that there's actually even more virus. The medians are, especially for the people who are coughing a lot, um, I think the medians are around 30 or 40,000 copies of virus that are released per 30-minute period. Um, and that I should point out here that the, the no cough indicates people who were just breathing and they were also asked, they were talking because they were asked to recite the alphabet three times over that 30 minute period. So the conclusion from, uh, from that data is that the majority of flu virus in terms of RNA copies is found in the fine, smaller than five micron, rather than the coarse or larger than five micron droplets and aerosols.